Welcome to Steve's Small Business Podcast. Small Business Wisdom for the Entrepreneur. Today's inspirational topic was made possible by Learn About Oil and Gas.com, our sponsors and partners, and by our Patreon supporters. Welcome to today's episode. Hey, Steve Imke here with Steve Biz Blog. Hey, uh, today I have a special guest, uh, Brad Witten. Uh, Brad is with an accounting firm here in Colorado Springs, uh, Pike Speak Financial Group. Uh, he is a colleague of mine at the Small Business Development Center, where we both volunteer our time to help small businesses. Uh, Brad is a CPA with many years of experience. He primarily helps small businesses in their tax planning efforts, as well as ensuring that they're uh, tax compliant. Uh, he is a Colorado native, uh, and he is also very active with an organization here called Homefront Cares, which is an organization that helps veterans. Uh, correct. Yeah, I've been involved with them for four or five years now. So. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you for, for helping those veterans out there. So um, but today I'd like to kind of discuss a little bit about what happened back in June. Maybe you can explain a little bit about uh, what happened with, uh, with Wayfair in the state of South Dakota and how that's affecting everybody's sales taxes. Well, you know, states have been uncomfortable with this for a number of years, largely due to the expansion of e-commerce and the Internet and, and you know, those types of challenges for, for states when it, as it relates to collecting sales tax and had been pursuing ever more aggressive rulings. So um, there was uh, 25 years or so ago, there was a case referred to frequently as the Quinn case which uh, held up the 1986 public law. So it was public law 86-272. That's the law that really established what you know, triggered nexus, what gave you a connection to a state. The Quinn case upheld that. Again, that was 25 plus years ago before you know, e-commerce, before the internet, before those types of things. So it wasn't as big of an issue. It made a lot of sense back then. Uh, South Dakota, you know, they started going after Wayfair with uh, increasing rulings, targeting consumers, sending out notices saying, hey, Wayfair is putting you in a position to owe tax. Are you aware of this? You know, and that's what started the, the court battle. Uh, it's actually a really interesting read if, if you're a nerd like I am and you enjoy that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, reading the history, it's, it's fun. But, uh, um, you know, long story short, they went through the lower courts. They ended up in, in front of the Supreme Court. And the fear for a lot of practitioners like myself was that the ruling that came out was what was going to happen. I mean, it makes sense. But essentially what the Supreme Court said is that, you know, that, that old law before the Internet, you know, you don't need a physical presence any longer to transact business within a state. You just don't, you know. And, and uh, because of that, and so essentially what they said is we got to get rid of that. We're going to replace the term physical presence with substantial you know, economic presence, which uh, South Dakota defined as, and I think we'll talk about this more a little later, but uh, $100,000 of sales or 200 transactions. And it's important to note the or, it's not an and, you know, so so 200, you know, keychains, for example, that at a dollar a piece or, or something nominal can get you into a sales tax bind rather quickly. Um, now, you know, the Supreme Court in striking out that ruling, they did you know, provide some limitation, a guideline. Um, they wanted states to try to get together and, and try to make compliance a little easier. Um, but that's the background. That's what happened. Uh, that's the quote unquote problem is the removal of physical and replaced with, you know, substantial or economic presence. Absolutely. Okay. So tell me, so have uh, all the states uh, followed suit with this or is it just South Dakota at this point? Well, you know, first, let's step back and, and let's look at, you know, what, what did the ruling really do? Well, uh, besides, you know, cause a little bit of panic for all of us in, in small business. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the Supreme Court within the ruling provided a checklist. And this checklist was to guide uh, really what they felt could, be, could withstand a legal challenge or what would be constitutional. Um, and, and there were really seven guidelines within that. And the reason I'm starting here is because this is what the states are trying to tackle and why implementation is, you know, not, I wouldn't say it's lagged, but why it hasn't been universal. Um, 
So the, the seven guidelines, the first was a safe harbor. So what the Supreme Court wanted states to do uh, is include a limited business clause. That's the $100,000 you know, sales number, 200 transactions. So that if you have five sales in the state of New Mexico, you know, you're not subject to sales tax. Great. So a okay. safe harbor for limited business. They wanted no retroactive collection. So if you put in a you know, law as of December 1st, you can't go back to January 1st and, and try to collect sales tax. So they wanted some protection there. Uh, they wanted a single state level administration. So instead of filing every little municipality, you file a state return and the state's responsible for uh, you know, dispersing that sales tax revenue. Uh, states are not too fond of that rule. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but uh, that's that's one of the guidelines the Supreme Court gave. The second, or the fourth, sorry, lost myself there, um, is uniform definitions of products and services. So right now, amongst municipalities, you know, Colorado has a, you know hundreds of, of jurisdictions itself, and a lot of times there's you know about 80% common, what is a product, what's a service, what's taxable, and then there's about 20%, again, on average, uh, it's a little different in each state, well, or in each uh, taxing jurisdiction. So what's an example of that? Well, you know, uh, like services, for example. Many, many states and localities don't tax service. Some do. There are a few throughout the nation, not here in Colorado, uh, but that do tax service sales. So uh, another example of a definitional problem is off-the-shelf software. You know, some localities treat that differently. Some will consider that tangible property subject to sales tax some don't. So, you know, you have those uh, nuances that vary between jurisdiction that, that again, is a challenge to understand. So, uh, the Supreme Court suggested uh, some clarity there, coming up with a uniform definition. Um, the fifth uh, item on the checklist was a simplified rate structure. Again, same problem. In Colorado alone, there's, you know, hundreds of different rate structures state, special district, county, you know, all these different rates to tackle. Uh, and they wanted that simplified a little bit. And the sixth was uh, some sort of software to allow access to rates and administration. So something where you could log into, type in an address, you know, and it will tell you what sales tax you need to collect for that destination, for that sale. Uh, and then the seventh is immunity from errors within the software. So if they give you a software, you type in an address, it tells you a rate, that rate's incorrect, you're still liable for the tax difference, but not a penalty or interest or, or anything like that. They didn't want you penalized for relying on a state provided, you know, tool. Um, and those were the seven, you know, items on the checklist that states were encouraged to comply with. So to date, um, there's been 12 states that have adopted all seven provisions of that checklist. Colorado is the most recent. It's the 12th. You know, they're it rolled out December 1st. They just delayed enforcement really until May, I believe. I just saw that yesterday. Um, for out, but, out of state, out of state people were in state. I think was December 1st or something like that. Right. right. There was a difference in there. Yeah. Good clarification. Thank you. But um, you know, so there, there's only been 12 states that have implemented all seven. The one caution I give to any any viewers out there, anybody listening to this is that as we're having this conversation, that could have just changed. I mean, that's how quickly it's moving. So, um, you know, don't, don't take that as gospel. There, there's 12 as of the right now, um, but that's changing literally almost every day. So um, then on top of that, there's another 12 states that have implemented five of the seven guidelines. What's curious about those 12 states is that the, the two guidelines they have yet to implement is a ban on retroactive collection and a safe harbor or a de minimis, uh, you know, ruling for small business or, or for limited business transacted within the state. I don't know what the compulsion is there for, for states. Maybe that's tricky, or they're hoping their their state legislature will step in and, and you know define that for them. I, I don't know, but um, those twelve have have left those two items off of their implementation. And so in those particular states, they're still wanting you to collect sales tax, but you, on the very first sale, for example, you'd be required since they don't have the, the minimus uh, element in there, nor, nor anything that you might have sold in January you might have been now obligated for? Correct. That's the fear. Now, the, the rulings don't implicitly say that. 
you know, it's not, uh, or explicitly, it's not within the, the ruling itself, but the lack of restriction on that is what causes the fear. Because if you don't, you know, provide protection for small business, my fear as a, you know, as a CPA is always if the law doesn't say they can't, at some point they will, you know, and so that's the, the concern and why the Supreme Court has even said in their ruling, we want that within any implementation or, or any rules that are passed out from the state. So that brings up a question. This isn't something I want to find out because I don't want to get involved in the, the legal battle, but, uh, you know, if, could it withstand a legal challenge? If they tried to implement that or retroactively collect sales tax from out-of-state retailers, uh, you know, somebody pushes back and, and takes that up, to, you know, sues them and takes that to court. I don't know that that could stand up, but that's not for me to determine. And I'm sure none of us want to be the guinea pig, you know, to to figure that out. But uh, that that is concerning for me, those 12 states. Um, oh, I'm sorry. So I was, I was going to say now, when, when you talk about that, I mean, are we talking 12 months like in a calendar year? Are we talking a roll in 12 months? How are they calculating all of that type? stuff well so that's kind of left up to the individual state to decide um and and every state is a little different you know colorado has an or it's uh, either the prior 12 months if you've heat or the prior year your your year uh if you've hit those thresholds you have to start collecting or the current year if you've hit those you have to start collecting so I prefer that than a rolling 12 months because it's it's more difficult, right? I mean, now we're tracking different things all over the place. We have our year, it's hopefully, you know, calendar or fiscal year. Then we have a rolling 12 months for the state to track. It creates more complexity that, that's frustrating. So uh, that is the challenge. Every state is different. They're all going to roll out their own little nuances of these rules. And that is one of the decisions they have to make is what is that, uh, you know, measurement period. So, all right, so like in the state of Colorado, for example, I know there's like 360 some odd different tar taxing jurisdictions. And, and I think you said that essentially there's one state application. So the worst case for any e-retailer or e-commerce company would be that they would have to apply in 50 different states, right? So the, the issue, I believe, is that you would begin to apply when you either reach that 200th item or exceeded that 100,000, that's when you would apply? Or would you apply prior to that in anticipation for that? Is there one that you would do at the state level that then would give you a tax license essentially for every taxing jurisdiction, including little small taxing jurisdictions? Yeah, I mean, good questions. Uh, so first, the beginning of your question, currently there's only 12 states that have a single point of collection. Um, there's another 12 that are working on that and then the rest are all over the place. But so, so currently if you're in one of those states that have a single point of collection and the state collects and distributes the sales tax, then yes, there is a simplified process of, of obtaining a sales tax license. Now the issue of when do you do that to me is one of the most critical questions because the uh, obtaining a sales tax license is going to open up Pandora's box, if you will. You're going to need to register as a foreign entity. You're going to need to get a sales tax license. You could be uh, now open to income taxation because this is a nexus ruling, not a sales tax specific ruling. Um, so we want to be real careful and diligent of when we apply for a sales tax license. Now, currently in, in every state that we've looked at, it's uh, the, the collection period starts immediately after you hit those thresholds, not before, not retroactive, but once you hit 200 transactions, for example, the beginning of the next period, you have to start collecting sales Period tax. or the, the, the 201th transaction? Period. So if you hit the 200th on you know December 27th, January 1, you have to start collecting sales tax on all transactions. Okay, periods being months then? Correct. Okay. Yep. Um, now, month is, is the smallest collection window. I mean, again, this is all over the place. Colorado actually determines how frequently you file when you obtain the sales tax license, right? They tell you initially you're a quarterly filer or you're a you know, monthly filer. Um, but it's never more frequently than monthly, so that's where I encourage we start is monthly. And if it's longer than that, so be it, but monthly is where we need to focus. Now, I can uh, imagine that you might be collecting sales tax, but then you may not be obligated to do that. What do you do then? Yeah, that's a, 
uh, a wrinkle. Okay, so we have a an issue there potentially that that's maybe not one I'm qualified to talk about. It's more of a legal question because from a retailer collecting sales tax, you collected that as a uh, trust fund essentially. You know, to remit that for a state or going to yeah agency. Correct. Yeah, as an agent for the state. Now, if you ultimately don't have an obligation to file, then that becomes a legal question of, do you have you know, a right to keep that money? I mean, clearly if you did, it's taxable from a tax standpoint, but you know, can you keep that money? Do you have an obligation to then file anyway, even though you're not required, or return that money to the consumer? I mean, those are really the three options, but that's why it's uh, another reason why we don't want to collect. In fact, I would err on the side of, not collecting than collecting too soon. Does that make sense? Yeah, you know, absolutely. I would wait until I was absolutely certain that I had a requirement because even as a business, it's going to be less costly for you to say, oh, you know, I missed 10 sales. I'm going to have to come out of pocket and, you know, pay the sales tax on these first, you know, 10 sales than have collected on, you know, 100 and then have to figure out, do I give it back? Do I you know, file anyway, do I, what do I do with that money? So I imagine you might be able to also remit those even though to the state, even though you haven't done that, I'm sure the states wouldn't turn your money away. Absolutely not. They wouldn't, but frequently what a state will require you to do is because from a state's perspective, they can't police what they don't know is out there. And so before they'll take money, they typically want you to fill out a you know, sales tax license, report it on a form. That way they know why they got money and where to apply it. Yeah. Otherwise, they have funds they don't know what to do with, which right. creates problems. Interesting. You filing a sales tax return and getting a sales tax license opens up your business to, you know, potentially other obligations. So so, so what, is the, what is the time frame typically for being able to apply for a sales tax license? So say it happens on December 29th, and now effectively your next period is January 1st. I don't believe you could get a... a tax license and everything all set up in that in that short a period of time. I think that would be a, a problem, you know, as well. Right. Yeah, you, you're correct. Yeah, most jurisdictions, there's no way you'd be able to get a license that quickly. Uh, but that's okay. I mean, you'd begin collecting sales tax as of 1-1. You start withholding the tax. You'll get the license, you know. In the next period. You know, two to four weeks or something. And really that license is, is required to file the return, to create your presence with the state. You know, that, that's doing a lot of things that don't necessarily impact your ability to collect sales tax right, right away. Yeah. So it's important to not marry those two. You know, yes, you need to get a license. Yes, you need to collect sales tax. Those may not happen at exactly the same time. I get it. Um, you know, uh, I don't know whether this applies to many other states, but I do know it applies here in Colorado. But here in Colorado, we have home rule cities which I know the state doesn't collect for. I mean, the state, the, the city that we live in, Colorado Springs, is a home rule city uh, established before, you know, Colorado became a state. And as a result of that, I do know from a retailer, I know you have to send in separate, you know, uh, uh, tax reports to the city because the state doesn't collect them. How, how does that get resolved in a particular state application? Does the city of Colorado Springs just not collect because they're not a home rule? Are you still going to be required to locate home rule cities? And I don't even know. Does this apply to other states and that kind of thing as well? That can seem to be quite complicated for, for anybody who's a, you know, a, a hobbyist or what would I'll call a, you know, a side hustle guy doing the arbitrage, buying stuff on Alibaba Express and, you know, for $2 and then selling it, you know, on, a, on their own WooCommerce store or whatever the case is for, you know, $5 and, and collecting the, the, the margin spread. So that seems to be very, very, you know, a complicated process. So how, how does a, how does a state with a home rule, you know, actually work, work through a process similar to this? Yeah, yeah great question. So uh, this is, is probably the, the most difficult piece of this ruling for a business to comply with because right now, like I said, we have 12 that have a single point. Now, let's start with those 12 first. The 12 states right now are working on a form. Now, I have not reviewed all the forms. I don't know what they all look like. But um, the theory behind it is that the state, you would have to report which jurisdiction, you know, which home rule city, which location you had a sale in 
the state collects all the tax and then divvies out those funds to the correct jurisdiction. So your responsibility is to report accurately and file the one return with the state and pay the tax and they take it from there. Um, the, other, the, the remaining states right now that aren't on board with that is where we really have a problem, if you will, because um, it would be your responsibility to, to determine when you hit the threshold, which is a statewide threshold, not a, you know, you don't have to have 200 cells in each locality or each home rule city or each, you know, jurisdiction. <laughs> that makes it a little easier. Yeah, and you have to have at the state level 200 cells within that state, and then that subjects you to tax, and then you have to pay each jurisdiction according to where a cell is located. Um, to add another wrinkle, some, uh, well, I don't think this is going to be a wrinkle. Most states are switching to the destination-based collect, you know, where do you ship the product is where you, you pay the sales tax. That used to be a question, too, that's largely been resolved now at most state levels. Um, but if the state isn't on the single point, you know, filing administration plan where you file one return, in Colorado, for example, if you had sales in all you know, the counties, you could be looking at 100 sales tax returns that need to be filed for each location. That is your responsibility to know rates, um, to know the correct form to file, to know special districts. You know, Colorado Springs has the uh, Pikes Peak Rural Trans uh, Transportation Administrator, PPRTA, that's a special district, you know, that a lot of people don't realize is there until you file a sales tax return for the first time. So, uh, and that's, that's, that might just be on one address on one block, and the next block over doesn't have that, right? I mean, those are very, very geographic there. It really yeah. does require entering the physical address of where you're shipping it to, to to understand exactly what jurisdictions you're going to be involved with. Correct. Yes. And that's a, what, what, largely what I've been encouraging businesses to do, my small business clients, since really January or December, you know, once we knew the ruling was on, or the, the case was on the docket for the Supreme Court, um, you know, most of us, we had to, to disconnect our hope, which was that the Supreme Court would not side with South Dakota. That was the hope. Right. Reality really from day one was that I, you know, there's no way you come to that conclusion, not as a rational, you know, we don't like it, you know, we don't like the compliance cost, but it is the right answer. And so I've been, you know, advising clients for months now, or a year approximately, to start monitoring this, because I think that's the key is to know, uh, put in a process where you're tracking the location, the destination of all your sales, start identifying whether it's an Excel or a tool that we'll talk about a little later or whatever your mechanism is um, to start identifying before you have a problem. You know, once you hit 100 transactions or something, you know, 150, it's your, your business, you know your volume better, you know, really understand how that works. But um, to start flagging potential hot zones, if you will, you know, I use an Excel spreadsheet that's coded red, yellow, and green like a stoplight system, you know, and, okay. and red is I'm over the, the thresholds I need to file. Yellow is I'm getting into the danger zone where I'm approaching those those levels, and green is I'm nowhere near, I'm in the clear, you know, and so that then gives you a tool to start looking forward a little bit and not responding to these requirements so much and proactively preparing for them. I think that's I, I can almost imagine some of these businesses literally saying, listen, I'm reaching, I've, I've just made 199 sales. I am no longer accepting sales from the state of Wisconsin anymore or whatever because I don't really want to have this, this implication. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's... The, the, the big negative from this ruling is exactly that. It's, uh, you know, on the face value, until you really dive in it and start feeling a little more comfortable, it's just kind of where I'm at. I'm a little more comfortable with this now. I don't think it's, it's you know, arbitrage or, or quite as, as horrible as I first thought. Um, but on the face value, if you're considering, you know, I have a client that was considering, you know, writing his own book, self-publishing, putting it up on Amazon, who really kind of put the brakes on that plan because he didn't want to get into this whole, you know, mess. So instead, he's just selling his books out of his clinic right now, you know, and he's sort of his revenue. But for him, it wasn't a main, you know, revenue generator. So it, it changed his plans. And I'm sure that's happening. And, and I'm just encouraging or trying to encourage people to um, look at this as a cost of doing business, if you will, and, and not so much, you know, don't let it change your desire. 
So, you know, I, I'm familiar with the clients that I talk to about sales tax. I definitely point them to uh, Colorado has that, uh, what is that, that DR 1002 document, which lists all the taxing jurisdictions and stuff. Uh, and, and so, I mean, as a, as a e-tailer, you're going to be taking that document and then somehow interpreting all of those and inputting them into various you know, a, a software program you have, or in your case, you were talking about a spreadsheet. That sounds like a horribly onerous task to be able to do to do that, especially since many of those taxing jurisdictions, the RTD tax that you talked about, the Pikes Peak Rural Transit District tax, is something that's there all the time. But many of these taxing districts districts kind of come up for a few years until a bond is paid off, and then boom, they disappear. So I mean, these are going to be coming and going constantly, and it just seems like a very onerous task to be able to seek out because they're all they don't all use the same form number and say I was reaching a, a limitation in the state of Wisconsin I mean now I have to I have to go to their their thing to find out what their you know what their documents are what their taxing jurisdictions are I mean that sounds pretty crazy so is there some type of a database or a, you know some centralized place where an individual can kind of go to that all the states that are implementing this uh, would you know put their documents so that you know it just be a single repository that people could go to rather than have to search each and every state because I can tell you from my experience I mean I uh, have businesses in Virginia and uh, uh, you know, in Ohio, I mean, they're all different in terms of how their Secretary of State handles things and everything else. And I mean, it's very difficult to navigate each and every one of those systems because they're not consistent. So I guess the question is, you know, is there some kind of a central database or are we as e-retailers e literally going out there now and having to, you know, do our own research on all 50 states? Yeah, so th there really isn't. Um, you know, there are sites out there that compile as much information as they can. Taxfoundation.org is a resource that I use a lot because they're pretty up to date and pretty accurate. But um, the problem with any of these sites or, you know, there, there's no true database supplied by the states or some, you know, entity that can be relied on, you know, with 100% accuracy or faith. All of these are right now are self driven websites where people, you know, like you or I might develop a website and try to pull all this together for everybody and put it all there with a big, you know, caveat at the bottom that says we're not, you know, taking responsibility for any of this. It's on you to figure out if this is right. Um, that's what's currently out there. As far as determining forms to file, determining rates, determining jurisdictions, all that is really hodgepodge right now. I suspect, I, I hope, that uh, somebody smarter than me on the software side is looking at this ruling and going, hey, I see a business opportunity here. You know, let me start working on a program or some way of interfacing with the states to maybe pull this together. There's, there's an opportunity here for somebody that wants to take it um, because there really isn't that one central site or software database that you can rely on. You know what would make sense for me, and I, I was trying to do some research to see if this, you know, if any of these shippers offered this. But it would make sense since most of these items are being physically shipped. For example, uh, that you know, a shipping company, call it UPS or Federal Express, since they know the jurisdiction of where it's being delivered, could in fact, you know, charge you. Hey, our delivery fee is for this is seven dollars and ninety five cents, but here's all the taxes that we're going to collect on the other end, and we'll do that for you. In other words, then you just go ahead and, you know, make that one big shipping thing. It would seem to me that those shipping companies would, would do that. I'm hoping that some of them will come on board with uh, with that kind of a product, uh, you know, that would really make a whole lot of sense. But um, I did have a question as it relates to, you had mentioned about this person who was writing a, a book and then and shipping it. So if I have an Amazon store with an Amazon fulfillment type of a, a situation, can I count on Amazon to actually take care of that, those types of sales things, as opposed to me just having an you know a place on Amazon, but not necessarily, you know, where... Amazon is doing the fulfillment for me. So you, I'm trying to make a little bit of a distinction there. Yeah, well, you know, currently Amazon, you know, they're, uh, if you get onto their website and kind of peruse their sales tax responsibilities and whatnot, they, they tell you right out front, 
Um, no, we, we don't take responsibility for any of this. They offer a add-on. I don't know what the cost is, but they do offer a you know a sales tax compliance piece um, to the to the, the seller platform, if you will, that you can plug into. Um, but in big big letters on the bottom, it says this only will you know assess and charge the rate that that you tell us. Basically, they have a database, they have default rates, and then they tell you how often they're updated, which is really not often enough, especially in this changing landscape. Um, but, but, you know, so they will, they offer a tool to integrate collection into the sales process, still your responsibility to file and pay the actual tax. Um, but they do have a tool that's maybe not as inclusive or comprehensive as I'd like it to be, uh, but it, it does help, um, but it still doesn't shift the responsibility. I mean, they're not taking risk. Uh, to, to allow you to rely on the rates that they've determined or anything like that. They, they really try to shift that back to, to the business owner, you know, to, to handle that responsibility. Um, you know, other sites like Shopify, Big Commerce, those kind of things. I mean, these are, these are companies that, you know, make their living by essentially taking a small e-retailer and saying, you know, we'll put up a store for you. I, I mean, are, are they beginning to kind of look at this and trying to figure out how they can you know, uh, uh, help the small business guy, uh, you know, comply to some of these kinds of things? Because, like, I mean, everything that we've talked about just sounds like such a big cloud of ambiguity and everything else. I could just see, you know, people just not being compliant. And, of course, you know, it's like, well, you should have known that, but, you know, how would I, how do I know that? I mean, it's, you know, I could see a lot of, a lot of problems here. Uh, so, I, mean, I guess what I'm trying to understand here is Shopify, Big Commerce, any of those companies, are they, to your knowledge, or are any of those looking at that and trying to help these people being able to do that? Well, I think they're all looking at it. Uh, I, I think the big problem right now, uh, and I'm familiar with Shopify, and I'll talk about sort of what they do right now, but um, I think the problem is that there's such ambiguity, as you alluded to, that a lot of these these platforms are waiting to figure out what is the final ruling, what do all 50 states want, what, is, what do we actually do, because right now, if you're Shopify, for example, you have 12 states where you know what to do, you know, you have another 12 where you kind of know what to do, and then the rest you have no idea what to do, you know, so, so that's the, the same problem that we have as business owners, these platforms are having as well, because sure, they'd love to, uh, for a fee, I'm sure, you know, offer you some compliance package or, or add-on or something to say, hey, we can do this for you for X amount of dollars per month. Um, and, and many of us, unless that was astronomical, I would take it in a heartbeat, you know, because the, the cost-benefit analysis there for a, a fee is going to be a lot less time-consuming on me and costly as a business, um, you know, to just pay that and let them handle it. But the problem is that there is such ambiguity. It's too new. Um, too many states still haven't decided or are still determining what they're going to do, which makes it impossible to comply at this point on a uniform basis. So, so Shopify, for example, um, they, they're similar to Amazon in that they do not remit or, or pay your sales tax on your behalf. They offer resources to assist with compliance. They kind of they try to pull in rates from the different jurisdictions to give you an ability to um, type in the uh, uh, address and figure out the rate you need to collect with the same caveat that it's on you to make sure this rate is correct. And they even let you override it. So, you know, they're, they're, what they're currently trying to do, many of these interfaces, and I'm not familiar with them all, so I'm largely speaking to the ones I do know. Um, but what they're really trying to do is say, you know, here's some help, here's some assistance, but we're not taking any liability, responsibility, nothing right now because we don't really know what all the rules are. So, so the steps here are the states need to finish all 50 of them you know, issuing their rulings and determining what they're going to do, then these platforms need to digest that. You know, they're and most of these big platforms have their own in-house accounting and legal staff um, that are going to then analyze these and determine what they can do for a fee where their liability lies. And then we'll see, I'm sure, some package or some option rolled out. But that's going to be, you know, 12 months, two years. I mean, at some point it's going to happen. I, I just don't know when. I get it. 
I would think that the most vulnerable are those that have their maybe a WordPress site using a free plugin like WooCommerce or something along that line. Where I mean, there's there's no big company back there. You own all the on onus of all of that. Uh, what is where's QuickBooks lie in this whole thing? I mean, if I'm sending out, you know, physical products with an invoice and and that kind of stuff. I mean, is QuickBooks coming on board now too with trying to do sales tax collections, that kind of stuff, or I mean, it, it, with a back end database or something like that? To your knowledge? Yeah, I mean, they're they're working on it. You know, they're they're similar stage, you know, to everywhere else. So QuickBooks, which is owned by Intuit, which is a huge player in the tax and accounting. Sure. Um, uh, landscape. So, so absolutely, they they saw dollar signs and opportunity when this you know ruling was passed out. They're currently working on a platform that will integrate with uh, QuickBooks. I have no idea what where that is you know in the integration process, but um, they are working on tools you know to allow or to ease this. And I suspect you know like I alluded to earlier that there's entrepreneurs there's business owners out there right now with an IT background or you know coding um, you know expertise that are looking at this and, and trying to determine what can we do what can we come to market with what can we sell I'm sure over time we're going to see resources available um, there, there's a couple of tools right now or, or platforms such as uh, Avalara and TaxJar um, I'm actually partial to tax jar because I like their fee a little better, but that's just me. Uh, and, and to be clear, I don't get paid by any of them, so you know, okay. Not Full disclosure. Paid. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, um, Avalara and Tax Jar have good integration with most platforms. You know, WooCommerce, Shopify, Amazon, eBay, Facebook, to where they'll plug in. Um, you know, to your sales system and start collecting, remitting, filing, automate the whole system of collecting and filing sales tax right now. Uh, now, that's a, a volume-based fee system, you know, so they don't tell you fees on the website. You can't call and, you know, me as a, you know, accountant say, hey, how much are you charging people to, you know, to do this? Because it really depends on your sales system, the number of sites you have, the volume of transactions. All of that, uh, I will say it's, you know, especially Avalara, they're not cheap, right. but, um, but they do provide uh, a very good product or system with peace of mind, you know, where you can rest easy that your taxes are being filed correctly, and if something is wrong or incorrect, you have a company that's standing in between you and the, the government there going, you know, we'll make this right, we'll fix it, so... Interesting. Um, the application process. Now, um, I, I would be responsible then to go to each state and complete their sales tax application process, which is obviously going to be different depending on whether they're a commonwealth, whether they're a state, and all these other kinds of things. And I'd have to go through that process. That's, that's how I understand it to work, correct? Correct. Okay. Now, something that you had alluded to earlier about... Um, sale uh, getting income taxes and how that relates so now I've reached maybe my hundred thousand dollars but I guess in most of the clients that I would deal with it's going to be the 200 transaction type of a, a number uh, and I could see that you know happening very easily like you said maybe you're selling just a keychain or something along that line for a dollar or so the question that I would have here is is that now you mentioned that it would now mean that I have to now register as a foreign entity in that state so that I could now go ahead and, and continue to pay uh, a sales tax or, or something like that. Is that I, I, do I have to have a foreign entity in that state to be able to pay income tax? Or I don't, I didn't think you had to have a foreign entity just to do that. Yeah, you do because um, in most states there, there could be exceptions. You know, I, I don't claim to be an expert in all fifty states. Um, you know, so so could there be an exception out there? Sure, but that's not the general rule, um, and that's because if we back up here a step, this again I alluded to earlier that this is a nexus ruling, not a sales tax ruling. Well, what nexus is, as I as I spoke to a bit earlier is presence. What gives you a connection to a state? What determines when you're transacting business within a state? That old physical presence ruling is now an economic test and not a, a physical location test where, you know, prior you need an employee, a warehouse, you know, something like that in a state uh, to be doing business there and then require you to register as a foreign entity. Now that those thresholds have been removed, 
this is not, you know, the, the, the nexus conversation applies to all taxes. It's not a sales tax, income tax, etc. It's really a, what gives you a connection to a state. Therefore, if you hit one of these thresholds, you now have a connection to that state, which means you have to register to legally be, you know, able to transact business within that state. You could have, uh, you know, a sales tax responsibility. You could be subject to income tax uh, for the sales to that state. You could have, uh, you know, some, a lot of states have an opportunity tax or a franchise tax or, you know, I, I call it a privilege tax. They basically charge you for the right to do business in their state, but, but you know, that level of tax as well. So, Right. So, so here's what I would suspect. So now I've, I've reached this 200 transactions. I now have to register. I have to pay a fee to be registered as that, you know, in that particular state. Now, because I'm not domiciled in that particular state, I'm going to also have to hire a registered agent, which is going to also incur some costs. I know in my particular situation, I have some businesses in Virginia, for example. And so, you know, I have to pay their $50 to be a foreign entity there each year. Then I have to go ahead and I have to register. I have to have a hire an attorney essentially to be my registered agent so you know that's another $75 for them to, to do that for me so you know I get it you know for me to do transact business gonna cost me 125 each year once I go over that 200 I guess that those are the types of processes that all these e-retailers are gonna have to have to face is, is that a, that's true right true statement that hundred percent correct every state that I'm you know aware of requires you to have an in-state agent you know so um, I always encourage people between between you know us here. Uh, I'm not really sure what a registered agent really does, except give you a mailing address, you know, in a in a given state. So um, you know, shop in that and make sure you're not you know you're, you're paying something. Well, there's, I know there's companies, for example, I own a restaurant in Ohio, and so I just have a company that acts as my registered agent. I pay them fifty bucks, and I'm done. You know, and, so. and all they do is essentially give you a, a in-state address that can right. be served legal documents or, or whatever. Somebody to be served and says, "Hey, you've been sued." What I real quick, what I tell business owners frequently is, is frankly, the income tax compliance piece really doesn't concern me all that much. Now, maybe it's I'm an accountant; I do it all the time, and you know, for me, it's. It's, uh, you know, every year, every almost every day type of activity, so it causes me no stress. But um, it really isn't that difficult to comply on the income tax piece. Sure, you have maybe a, you know, additional cost with your accountant to file in five states instead of one or, you know, some incremental cost increase there. Uh, but it's really not that onerous. You know, you get a credit for taxes you pay to other state in your home state. You're not double taxed. You just pay the higher rate of the two. Um, you know, so that that really doesn't worry me all that much. Um, really, the the onerous piece of this is the sales tax compliance. That's the hard part. Uh, it sounds like it. It definitely sounds like a huge tar pit for any uh, any small business. Uh, uh, you know, e-commerce type of a uh, person there. So um, what would you add here? Was there anything that I didn't ask here today that, that you think our, our listeners would be, uh, you know, should hear? Well, no, I mean, I think we covered it pretty thoroughly, these topics. Um, you know, the, the one thing I've been stressing to people is just don't overreact, don't panic. You know, this, this is not a reason to stop doing business or to stop, you know, e-commerce activity it's just not i mean it's a it's another cost of doing business it's another process we have to comply with just like anything else there's a learning curve there's a period of time where we have to adjust and figure out the rules and put in processes to comply or tools or or whatever to adjust and there will be a learning curve but you know in the next year or so or two years once all this becomes normal it's going to just be another bump in the road that we overcame and continue down our, our path to, to success and running our businesses successfully. So the, the one thing I've been preaching to people, well, there's several things, but it's, it's just don't overreact. You know, don't stress yourself out too much. These states, it's new to them. They're rolling out their rules. I've never come across a state in, in 15 years of being a CPA that is looking to punish somebody that's trying to do the right thing. You know, making a mistake on a sales tax return 
is a, is a nominal cost. It's not the end of your business. They're not looking to you know ruin you. Or the only time you need to worry about a state on sales tax collection is if you're ignoring it completely. You know, trying not to comply and, and dodge it. Up. And then you need to worry. But if you're trying to comply and do the best you can, you're going to be okay. Awesome. Well, thanks, Brett, for uh, for coming on today and uh, and discussing this uh, this topic. That's uh, I'm sure very near and dear to uh, many of my uh, viewers, uh, uh, you know, what, what they're looking for here and, and trying to find some answers and stuff like that. So, great. Well, thank you very much. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening and please consider becoming a Patreon subscriber so we can continue to provide our content free to everyone.